My name is Lou Verschel. I'm the uh, Environment Director at uh, C4, and I'm talking today with Steve Leonard, who's our Senior Policy Analyst here today. Steve, I'd like to just get your feeling as to where you think the, the negotiations are likely to go. What are the key issues we're likely to see in Lima? Uh, yeah, so the, um, the, the, the climate negotiations at the moment in terms of a, uh, a new climate agreement are, are occurring under a, um, a process which is the ad hoc working group on the Durban platform, which was a process that was established in, in 2011. Um, at this stage uh, of the process, it's uh, looking at um, five elements within, within the context of climate, so mitigation, adaptation um, and means of implementation, which includes capacity building, um, technology transfer <coughs> and finance. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, moving in, into, into Lima, at the moment there are a couple of outstanding issues. Um, so um, one which, uh, which I think is uh, particularly interesting is, is, is around adaptation and moving in the direction of um, whether or not to establish a, a global goal for adaptation and so um, there's a, a lot of discussion about how to go about measuring um, adaptation and so discussion moving in uh, the direction of, uh, of metrics to measure adaptation which I, I find to be, to be quite a, uh, an interesting shift. Um, we're seeing a, uh, a significant uh, change in terms of the balance between the discussion um, uh, concerning adaptation and mitigation, uh, the negotiations um, and the outcomes to date have been very uh, mitigation focused, as, as you'd be aware. Um, and so um, I think that uh, we can possibly expect the, uh, the new agreement to be uh, more balanced in that context. Okay. Um, there's, uh, there's a significant uh, emphasis on, on scaling up finance. Um, and so the, uh, the, uh, the recent uh, IPCC uh, report, which is uh, emphasising the urgency of addressing uh, climate, is, uh, is, is, is important. So that's uh, resonating through the negotiations in terms of, uh, of finance, which is linked to the, uh, to the Green Climate Fund. Um, another, uh, another important issue which is, uh, which is uh, expected in terms of an outcome in Lima is the uh, intended nationally determined contributions, which is um, known as, uh, in, in terms of an acronym, as INDCs. Mm -hmm. Now this is a, uh, <coughs> the discussion here is the, uh, the scope of the contributions, um, whether that will be uh, only limited to mitigation um, or whether or not it will be a broader scope and include uh, adaptation and uh, means of implementation, so technology uh, transfer, uh, finance and, and capacity building. Um, uh, in terms of uh, forests uh, and, and land use, land use is expected to be um, included in, in INDCs um, and there's been some, um, some uh, interventions <coughs> to say that uh, Red Plus will also be expected uh, to be included as, as an INDC. So um, we're moving in the direction at the moment uh, to determine the scope of the information and the type of information that will be um, submitted as a part of, of country contributions in, um, in, uh, in early 2015. Um, so Lima will provide um, a decision which, um, which will set out the, uh, the scope of the information, whether or not it's um, to be limited uh, to mitigation um, and, uh, or, or whether or not it's to be uh, in inclusive of, uh, of the, other, uh, the other areas, so adaptation and, and, and means of implementation. Um, and uh, the, other, the other side of the, uh, of the, uh, of the negotiations concerns um, the uh, pre-2020 mitigation potential um, and so there's been uh, a lot of work um, ongoing in terms of technical expert meetings to establish um, where there is uh, pre-2020 um, mitigation potential that can be scaled up between now and 2020. Um, and there's been uh, technical ex expert meetings held um, on, on land use um, and um, more, more recently on, on non-CO2 emissions and uh, with some focus on the agriculture sector. Um, and so there'll be uh, an agreement that'll come out of, uh, out of Lima there, which is also within the same um, platform, the, the, <coughs> the ADP. Um, and, uh, and, and so it will, uh, it's intended to then provide guidance and direction to other institutions within the UNFCCC, so the Green Climate Fund or the Adaptation Fund um, or the technology institutions um, to assist them in terms of prioritising uh, the direction um, and, and, uh, and, and the provision of finance. Mm -hmm. Great. And for forests and land use in general, where, where do you see things going? There still, still needs to be some discussions around safeguards, right? Um, where, where do you see agriculture going in, in these negotiations and what, where, is it coming out only in adaptation or is it actually getting into the mitigation side of the discussion? Yeah, so just starting off with agriculture, it's, um, it's currently uh, being discussed within the uh, SUBSTA, uh, the subsidiary body um, on scientific and technical uh, advice, which is uh, an advisory body to the, um, to the COP, so the Conference of Parties or the broader UNFCCC uh, framework. Um, and the, uh, the agriculture discussion has, uh, is currently um, being dealt with within the context of adaptation, mostly. 
um, there is some, um, there, there is some uh, consideration of, uh, of agriculture in a mitigation context and that, um, that came through um, very clearly in the, in the, in the recent uh, technical expert meeting on, uh, which covered non-CO2 emissions. So looking um, at the, uh, the, the near term potential in terms of uh, mitigation from the agriculture sector. Um, it's, uh, there's a roadmap that's been agreed um, as, a part of the, uh, as a part of the Substa process which takes the agriculture adaptation discussion through to 2016. Right. And where do you, where do you see the, the discussion on safeguards going? We hear a lot of talk that there's a need for additional guidance for, in the safeguards. Uh, is there anything coming out of the preliminary discussions leading into to Lima? Yeah, yeah the, um, the safeguards discussion is, uh, is interesting. It's been going on for, for a number of years. So when, um, when guidance was uh, originally developed, um, there were a lot of criticisms as to whether or not that guidance was, was adequate and the, the reason that it was agreed on at that point in time was, was because there wasn't uh, enough um, in terms of demonstration activities and implementation of Red Plus um, and reducing emissions from the forest sector um, on, the, on, on the ground. So a lot of countries wanted to wait until there had been um, more um, experience and more, more, more lessons learned in terms of the demonstration activities to then feed into, into the discussion. Um, some are still saying that that is, is, is needed, so I have heard very recently that there's a potential for this discussion to even continue to go on, which may well be the case, because, um, which, which isn't such a bad thing, because the Safeguards Information System is, is, is in, intended to be something that's, that, that's evolving and, and built on over time um, in any event. Um, so there's been a submissions process that was undertaken um, and, uh, and a number of parties and non-governmental organisations have, have made submissions and the main concerns that are coming out is whether or not um, further guidance concerning safeguards will, will be um, an, a, an extra burden that will slow the process down. So you have some countries that are further ahead in terms of implementation of Red Plus than, than others. Um, but there's a counter argument to that when it comes to the capacity of, 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 of least developed countries in, in, in the context of whether or not there's adequate guidance to, to, uh, to enable them to be able to be putting safeguards um, systems in place and reporting on safeguards. So it's a, um, it's a, I, th I think that we'll find these, uh, these discussions will play out quite significantly in, in Lima um, with uh, if, if any further guidance is to come out, it'll be guidance that attempts to take that balance into consideration. Um, CSOs and um, Indigenous peoples are, 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 are making a very strong um, argument in terms of um, enhancing emphasis on participation in uh, the implementation of safeguards and reporting of safeguards. Um, and so that will also be a, a significant uh, component in, in, in the negotiations in Lima as well. Uh, so uh, Lou, I'd be uh, interested to know, I'd, in the um, in the negotiations in, in Bonn in, in June in, in uh, this year, there was uh, some concerns that were raised by, by Brazil in terms of the importance of finalising the discussion concerning uh, metrics and the linkage between um, metrics and, and the new climate uh, agreement. Um, and uh, I'd be interested to know from you where that discussion is headed at the moment in the context of the current um, metrics um, issues within the, within the Kyoto Protocol um, and also the, uh, the importance of, um, of, of non-CO2 emissions um, in the, in the, in the pre-2020 term. Right. Well, the, the, the metrics issue is, is, a, is a it's an interesting one. It's a very technical one. Um, and there was a lot of new information that came out of the IPCC report um, in, in the fifth assessment report um, with new, new uh, what we call global warming potential uh, values, which a fix of relative value between the different greenhouse gases relative to, to carbon dioxide. So it, it allows countries to make trade-offs or, or decisions about how they're going to deal with the different greenhouse gases and the mix of greenhouse gases in their policies. Um, so for example, if, if you're looking at um, agricultural emissions and you want to deal with methane, you want to try to relate that to, to, uh, to carbon dioxide, the, the global warming potential uh, is, is one metric that you can use to, to, to relate methane in, in terms of carbon dioxide. So, uh, so many tons of, of reductions of methane is equivalent to so many tons of reduction of, of carbon dioxide. Nitrous oxide is also another one that's important in agriculture. The F gases in, in industry are also uh, important. All these have different warming potentials. And, and the discussion around the metrics is because none of the metrics are perfect. So the, the global warming potentials shift over to the time frame that you look at. So methane, for example, has a very high global warming potential if you're looking at 20 years and a very low uh, uh, global warming potential if you're looking over 100 years because it only lives in the atmosphere for about 12 years. So if you're looking at 20 years, most of what's been emitted today is, is already out of the atmosphere. Um, so, so that has a very variable um, uh, 
uh, warming potential. Nitrous oxide is a very long-lived gas. It stays in the, in the atmosphere for, for over 100 years, so it, ha it has a very constant um, uh, value as you look across time uh, or, or time scales. So, 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 but, but the global warming potential is, is not perfect because although it's called warming potential, it's actually an energy measure. It's not a temperature measure, and there are temperature measures. Um, so if, if we're trying to, to hit a goal of two degrees C as, as the maximum um, warming we want to achieve, the global warming potential isn't the best measure to use. It would be the global temperature um, uh, factor that would be a, a better one to use. So, so, so these are some of the things that, that, that they're wrestling with. There's also trade-offs. You know, um, which, what the time frame that you use and, and, and the, the values you assign to these um, have a lot of uncertainty around them. So how do you, you factor that uncertainty into uh, regulations, for example? So if you want to regulate emissions from, from, from airlines, for example, and you want to factor some of these things into the design and operation of your airlines, uh, your, your planes, how, how do you, you take this uncertainty into account? Um, so, so it has a lot of implications for, 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 for you know, between country negotiations, for trade-offs, for, for implementation. Um, just, just what the metrics are. And certain metrics uh, adva have advantages to certain countries and, and, and disadvantages to other countries. Certain countries like New Zealand, for example, 50% of their greenhouse gas emissions come from methane from livestock. You know, and, and so their, their big emissions reductions are going to come in a non-CO2 um, uh, greenhouse gas. How does that relate to something that another country is going to achieve uh, if China is, is reducing its CO2 emissions from, from coal burning, for example? How do those two countries understand what each one of them is contributing and, and, and negotiate you know, between them how, what, who's going to do what and who's going to, who, who's going to make what sort of contribution? So it, it's, it's, it's central. It's very technical, but it's, it's central to, to what they're doing. The good news is that the, the, the ultimate metric that's used has very little impact on the overall, overall cost of emissions reduction, but it does have an impact on who pays the cost, and that's where the, the, the rub really is. Now, if I could just ask you another question. In, the, um, in terms of non-CO2 emissions, there was a, um, a technical expert meeting that was held uh, most recently in, uh, in, in Bonn as part of the negotiations mm -hmm. in, uh, in October. Right. Um, and one of, the, uh, one of the interesting policy approaches that came out of that discussion in terms of pre-2020 um, near-term mitigation potential was, um, was the landscapes approach was, mm -hmm. was specifically identified and, um, and it would be interesting to know um, how a landscapes approach is, um, is relevant to um, non-CO2 emissions and, and near-term mitigation potential in a pre-2020 context. Yeah, you know, the, the landscape approach is, is it's extremely important. What's happened, the, the carbon emissions from, from la in landscapes only happens associated with land use change. But everything else is really the non-CO2 gases. So if you're, if you're fertilizing crops, it's nitrous oxide that's coming out. If you're, you're managing soil, it's nitrous oxide that you're producing. If you're managing manure, it's nitrous oxide and methane that, that, that you're um, the producing. And if you have livestock in there, it's, it's you know, enteric fermentation, the, the, the fermentation inside the animal that's producing the methane. So, so, if, if you want to manage these landscapes and take a landscape approach to it, you, actually, you have to deal with all these gases because at least half of what's coming out of those landscapes is typically not CO2 and, and, and these other gases. So I'd like to ask you, Steve, a, a bit about um, what, what's happening with finance and the Green Climate Fund. We have the, a, a major commitment by the U.S. government uh, of $3 billion. We know that the, the target is to get $10 billion in the door by, by Lima and, and then scale that up. Uh, you know, wh where is that going and, and, and are we on track to, to, to meet the targets that the people are setting? And, and um, you know, what, what can we expect over the next couple of years as we, we move towards Paris and beyond? Yeah, well, the Green Climate Fund's been, uh, it's, it's been an interesting process to, to, be, to be following. Um, when it first, uh, over the first couple of years, there were a lot of criticisms and, um, and uh, a lot of people were um, commenting to me that they weren't expecting that it was going to be something that, that managed to get off the ground and um, the, uh, the Green Climate Fund board has worked significantly hard to, um, to, to get all of the pieces in place to be able to, um, to have a, a framework that's suitable to, to potential donors. Um, a resource mobilisation process was, uh, was put in place um, around midway through this year where the, uh, where the fund started to engage with donors and hold um, a series of, of meetings um, to, uh, to, to discuss the, and to, to inform don potential donors on, on the framework and, 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 and to look at, uh, at, uh, at, at obtaining potential pledges. There's been a number of uh, pledges that have been made over the last couple of months. Um, the, one of the most recent ones, as you correctly point out, is the, uh, is the $3 billion pledge by the US. Um, Japan have also recently announced a $1.5 billion pledge. 
um, and there are some um, reports at the moment about a potential pledge from um, from Canada um, and uh, and potentially a, a, a pledge from the UK. I think that, that, that the Green Climate Fund will, will, will make it to the $10 billion mark, whether or not it makes it uh, beyond that and, and to, the, to the higher end of the, of, of, the, of, the, of the desires there in terms of $15 billion, then, then that remains to be seen. Perhaps not, but, um, but uh, even, even so, $10 billion um, in, in 2014. Um, questions remain as to um, when that finance will be delivered, over what period of time that finance will be delivered, um, bearing in mind also the, uh, the ultimate goal there of the Green Climate Fund, as was pledged um, previously, uh, uh, to, to reach 100 billion um, and, and be mobilising 100 billion uh, in finance for, uh, for climate adaptation and mitigation um, per year. Um, by, by 2020, we still do seem um, quite, a, uh, quite a long way off um, yeah. in, in, in that context. Okay. And there was, a, there was a meeting recently in Barbados, I believe, that had some, um, some interesting outcomes for, for finance for red. Can, can you yeah. tell me a bit about what, what that was? Yeah, so the Barbados uh, meeting was, uh, was, was interesting because they, it was the, the first meeting that was being held by the Green Climate Fund after it had put its, um, what, it, what it refers to as its, as its eight pillars um, in place to be um, in a position to, uh, to begin to mobilise finance. Um, and it was also its first meeting after a number of pledges had come in. So. Um, the board had a much better idea as to what it was that, uh, that the countries were, were seeking um, in terms of uh, in, in, in the, the fund itself. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the interesting outcomes from Barbados was a decision concerning Red Plus um, and a, uh, a results-based payments framework. Um, uh, and so the, the Green Climate Fund, out of, out of all of the areas of sort of mitigation and, and adaptation, Red Plus seems to be one which um, is, is being singled out for further development. Now, um, there are some discussions concerning whether or not there should be a, a specific Red Plus window, um, and perhaps as things develop within the, within the Green Climate Fund, um, there might be um, more um, understanding as to the specific requirements for, for Red Plus. So um, two that come to mind immediately um, where the Green Climate Fund does need to do some further work um, are around alignment with the Red Plus Cancun safeguards and the Green Climate Fund safeguards, mm -hmm. which, which are inconsistent with one another. So there does need to be um, a certain level of, of harmonisation between those right. two different approaches. Um, and also um, in terms of non-carbon benefits, um, there's, there's currently no clarity within the Green Climate Fund as to how, um, how the fund will, will, will incentivise non-carbon benefits in, a, in the context of, of Red Plus. And so, um, and so that then takes us in the direction of, uh, of, of discussions concerning mitigation, adaptation, adaptation linkages to non-carbon benefits and, and these types of more, more technical um, and, and somewhat political discussions.